Hola, it's Brian De Los Santos. You're about to listen to a great episode of How to LA, but I wanted to give you a little FYI. This podcast is listener supported, and right now we're in the middle of our fall member drive. So head to las.com slash join HTLA to show your support. Thank you. I'm Antonia Cerejido. She has not given an interview since her resignation a year ago. Until now. My name is Nuri Martinez. Find out what Nuri says about the leaked tapes and the political fallout. Nuri and the Secret Tapes, wherever you get your podcasts. LAist Studios. I think it's really clear that you regret what you said, but I'm curious, looking back, why do you think you said that? Where was it coming from? Have you thought about why you said what you said? I've thought about that particular day, God, a thousand times. This is How to LA, the podcast that helps you navigate this city. Today, I'm talking with a friend of the pod and colleague, Antonia Serejido, who you just heard, the host of the LA Studios podcast, Imperfect Paradise. We spoke when the series first launched, and we talked about why and how the team decided to report this out. If you haven't heard that conversation, you can check it out on our feed. Today, we're talking about part three of Nuri and the Secret Tapes. It's an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at the LA City Council's tape scandal that rocked Los Angeles and became national news one year ago. The secret tapes that were leaked online were recorded two years ago in October 2021. In them, then LA City Council President Nuri Martinez, council members Gil Cedillo, Kevin De Leon, and labor leader Ron Herrera talk candidly making racist and demeaning comments about colleagues, Black political power, Indigenous people, and even a council member's child. In part three, Antonia presses Nuri about the racist and hurtful things she said on the tapes. Thanks for coming back on How to LA, Antonia. Hi, Brian. So part three is out today, and this is where you really drill down with Nuri about her racist comments and whether she gets why they were so hurtful. Mm -hmm. You also get at the cultural and political context behind the scandal to understand the deep-rooted issues that need to be talked about, like anti-Blackness in the Latino community. What did you go in expecting to learn? And was it different or the same when you walked away from it? I had spoken to Nuri quite a bit off the record. And in that time, we actually did not discuss what she had said on the tapes. So all of that was me hearing it for the first time as well. So I really didn't know what she was going to say. And I was super curious. I was very curious if she had spent time reading, if she had, you know, reflected on the pain of her words. And so then it was very interesting for me to realize that, like, in a way, Nuri was, like, stuck in time. Like, she hadn't actually moved forward it felt from the scandal like she had like hold herself away in her house she hadn't left and in her mind like this was something that happened to her which by the way I actually think is worth pointing out that these tapes were illegally recorded they were held on for a year so it was definitely a coordinated plan of attack or whatever to put them out and that the first reddit post about the tapes The writing doesn't include anything about racism. Mm. The writing from the Reddit post says, look, the Fed, the L.A. County Fed is in bed with the city council. Mm. And so I think that even the people who are intending for this takedown didn't even realize the most offensive part of the tapes. And so I think that Nuri was so caught up in that and being upset that this had happened to her that she still had not actually dealt with the fact that the reason people were so upset was her own words. Um, And so, like, I didn't know how she was going to answer that. And I think (sighs) you'll hear in in the episode, I ask her time and time again about the meaning behind her words. And I felt that she really was not ready to go there. And you examine Nuri's racist remarks and how these terms are often viewed differently in Spanish versus in English, the way we talk, right? One of the things that got the most attention when the scandal broke last year was the term Nuri used to describe former councilman Mike Bonin's son. How does she respond to your question? I mean, she really did not want to see it as part of a larger uh, anti-Blackness issue. She did not see any racism in what she said. She said that that's not what she intended. 
What did you mean when you called his son, uh, when you said about his son, parece changuito? The way I grew up with that word, parece changuito, has nothing to do with the skin color of anyone's ethnicity. It's got to do more with the behavior. You're sort of just playing around, you're horsing around. Eres travieso. You're just, you can't stay put. She really did not see that there was any racism in what she was saying. And then, um, you know, I followed this up in the podcast with part of the conversation I had with the anti-blackness in the Latino community scholar, Tania Hernandez. And I think she really does a really great job at explaining really what those words meant. When we want to talk about the ugliness of blackness, the inferiority of blackness, we use animalistic comparisons or we refer to the person as being like an animal. And so this idea of thinking of African ancestry as less than human and part of the animal kingdom that excludes humanity is a deep part of our racialized sort of understandings. Wow. This goes back to colonialism, the caste system, and all of that. Yeah. And I think, you know, then Tanya says something that I think is important to remember and I think does add nuance to this conversation, which is that These conversations about racism are also happening right now in Latin America. And in many ways, Latin America, at least parts of it, are behind the U.S. in terms of really looking at the language that we use in Latin America and how it stems in colonialist thinking, racialized thinking. And I think that, like, what's really interesting to me is that Nuri is able to understand why saying a word like monkey in English towards a black kid is messed up, but not changuito in Spanish. And I think one thing that she tries to do with me is be like, I'm a working class chick. This is how we talk in the working class. Basically, you're talking to me in, like, academic or, like, Twitter words. Mm. Um, But yet somehow in English, we know that that's messed up. And that is not stemming from, like, academic Twitter words. So I really think it speaks to like how parts of Mexico and certain communities in Mexico like have not grappled with this in a deep way. Um, and I think that there is a code switching that that is happening there. And I don't think I mean, I had a conversation with a white friend of mine where I was explaining that there's a code switching happening. And she was like, but Nuri must have known that she was going to be translated into English. And I was like, No, she wouldn't have known that. And that doesn't make it not racist. But I think it's like, I hope that what this does for people in the Latino community is makes them think twice about how they're using a word like changuito. You also get at the perception of a zero sum. Like when Nuri council members Gil Cedillo, Kevin DeLeon, and union leader Ron Herrera talk about redistricting the tapes, they frame it as the success of the Latino community comes at the expense of the black community. We spoke with Manuel Pastor about this, and he has a term for it. Latino triumphalism. What I mean by that is that if there's a sense that you're becoming the majority and that what that means is that you should act like an old majority, meaning that you should erase other people's histories, that you should try to dominate the political scene in order to protect your group, that's old majority thinking. How do you feel like this fits into the larger context of the secret recording? I think to me, this part of the story is very important because of the conversation around demographic shifts in the city. Um, I think one thing that I really wanted to point out in episode two was how Pacoima, where Nuri grew up, used to be a predominantly black working class neighborhood. Mm -hmm. At one point, it was 75 percent black. And by the time Nuri was growing up there, it had completely like inverted. Like then there was a lot of mostly Mexican and Central American families moving in. And you're seeing the same story happen in South L.A. And I think that that demographic shift has created some very complex dynamics um, in parts of the city. And frankly, like, I also don't want us to lose sight of the fact that, like, we're seeing the Latino and Black community basically have this crabs in a barrel mentality where they're trying to get the most they can while white people on the West Side are kind of like cruising by. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that we should remember that that's the context of all of this. These are the areas that often struggle the most to have resources. You hear them on the tapes talk about the importance of having assets. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really sad to hear them say like, oh, the black people can have this and then we'll have that. And it's just like shocking to hear them talk in this way. But it's also indicative of a larger demographic shift conversation in which like, Both black residents and Latino residents are, you know, fighting to 
make a stronger foothold in the city and have more influence and have more resources and be treated with more respect. And the aftermath, the fallout, you know, there was a lot of Latino activists actually protesting for these council members to step down. Mm -hmm. And so it was within the community of the Latino community, right? So I feel like that example shows how complicated it was. I mean, like the fallout, the the tapes, but also like the fact that like Latinidad is not one thing, right? Absolutely. And I actually, going back to Manuel Pastor, when he says that's old majority thinking, you know, I talked to younger progressive Latinos on the council, including Eunice Hernandez, and she said it shouldn't matter if your representative looks like you, it should matter what their values are. And I think that that is something that I really wanted to explore in episode two. Um, I think part of the issue is that when we're talking about like what Latino power is, it's like, what does that even mean? And in episode two, we also hear how Nuri, um, how her family decided to be Democrats. Mm -hmm. And it's like almost arbitrary. Her dad was like, Republicans tend to be rich and Democrats tend to be poor. And she's like, well, we're poor, so I guess we're Democrats. But that's not speaking to a set of values. Right. Or a vision of the future that they would like. It's speaking to like, this is just who we are. And we as a community want to advance in this system. But it's not proposing a kind of vision or system that will benefit everyone. And I think that was really important for me to to point out and to show through episode one where you hear the community rising up. It's that Nuri is presenting this one very particular view of what Latinos want in the city. But you see that there are a lot of Latinos who don't agree with that view, and who also think it's completely irrelevant whether she's Latina or not, but rather have a set of values that they would like to see instilled at the city council level. And, you know, we do have to point out that, you know, Kevin DeLeon has launched a re-election campaign. You make known of that in your reporting. He told the LA Times this week in a story they published that he should have shut that meeting down. That's in quotes. What's your take on where L.A. is as a community after this? And what have you learned from your reporting when it comes to holding people accountable like Kevin DeLeon, who's, you know, relaunching his campaign? So we actually reached out to Kevin and um, his team and they declined. But one of the to me, the sad things is that it's been reported that other council members don't want to work with him. A lot of nonprofits are struggling to figure out how to work with him in his district. And I think that further isolates the Latino community. And I think what this has done has sort of isolated a segment of the Latino community. And I think even hearing Nuri talk about how her community has more conservative values than other parts of the city, like, I think you're, I think for me, the the thing that was important to focus on is that, like, this is a story very much about, like, where are Latinos politically right now? And I think it's not reflective of just LA. I think it's a broader conversation. I think that Unices did a good job at showing how, like, for Nuri, what was important is fighting for like working class people. And she's very concerned with people who are janitors, who are hotel workers, you know, people who do genuinely do some of the most difficult jobs in the United States. But that in the advocacy for these folks, the policies themselves can then have adverse effects on other folks. And I think that that holistic approach to governing um, is much more difficult to accomplish and I did not see her thinking in that way. In the tapes, there's this sense of like resentment towards black political power that you hear, right? Mm-hmm. In one part, Gil Cedillo and Kevin DeLeon suggest that the black community has an outsized influence in LA, but that also fuels the sense of erasure for many black voters. Does Nuri get that? You know, she really emphasized to me how she feels Latinos are being are becoming invisible. Um, and, you know, she didn't talk to me about this feeling that that the black community has of of their community dwindling in numbers in the city of L.A. Do you think black people have disproportionate political power in Los Angeles? And do you think it's come at the expense of Latinos? Not necessarily. I think the Latinos need to work on unifying our community. I don't think we have to blame anybody else. You also spoke to Marquise Harris Dawson, a black city council member. What's his sense of this tension and competition between black and Latino communities for political power and representation? You know, Marquise said really interesting things. He actually told me that when he heard the tapes, he's like, it's not uncommon for different um, ethnic groups on the council to like, quote, roll with each other. He's like, you know, sometimes he'll, he's like the black city council members will get together and we say we're going to roll together on this. The white city council members will get together and say we're going to roll on this. So he also because he knows more of how the sausage is made than I would, was actually not that surprised by how the conversation took on these racialized terms. 
Um, but for him, he actually expressed an- another interesting thing to me, which he said in the same way that even though most Angelinos are not business owners and yet business actually has a large seat at the table in the city council, he said that the black community should sort of operate in a similar way, which is like even though it's small, there are people who are impacted at a disproportionate level to policies. And then the other thing that he w- said is that the political power that black Angelinos have earned, they've earned it. People have been doing voter registration drives since the 1960s consistently. And so that doesn't happen by mistake. And I think, you know, I think in the tapes you hear that the Latino leaders are jealous of that um, and that they see that the black politicians have been more successful at it. But by when they point out that they've been successful at it, they do it in a derisive way. I mean, you know, Kevin is saying, like, I didn't say that much in the meetings. He's the one who said... You hear 25 black people shouting in a room, it sounds like 250. Yeah, that quote Um, is, wow. Yeah, and I think when it comes to political power, I think that's pretty staggering to hear someone say that. We'll be back with Antonia talking about her reporting in this series. Hi, it's Brian De Los Santos. Thanks for listening to How to LA. I want to personally invite you to become an LAS member today during our fall member drive. Donating $10 a month actually does help us out. You're not just investing in this podcast, you're also investing in your community. Help us dive into neighborhoods, capture unique experiences, and share them with you. Give today at las.com slash join HCLA, and let's keep learning about this beautiful, complicated city together. Gracias. You know, before podcasts and smartphones, we had the cassette tape and Walkman. I'm Simon Adler from Radiolab, and I'm bringing our series Mixtape, the story of how the cassette tape changed the world, to the Crawford in Pasadena. It is going to be an immersive experience that you will become part of. It is on November 1st. Get tickets at LAist.com slash events. Welcome back to our chat with Imperfect Paradise host, Antonia Cerejido. I was so, I don't say excited, I was so like curious when your team sent me the draft of episode three so I could listen to it before this interview. Mm -hmm. And I was glued. I was like, I want to hear everything that Nuri said just because I feel like I know her. I feel like she's that tia that I could have grown up with, right? And people in my own community, my own settings. I want to hear what Nuri says to Antonia. And there are times when you can tell that Nuri's not really addressing your questions. She's kind of sidestepping, but you keep pressing, you keep asking the question in different ways. After challenging her for hours, I think you said it was a four hour interview in studio at different days. Did you get a sense of the real Nuri Martinez or did you just get the politician Nuri Martinez? I think when she talked about her upbringing, she was very much herself, she's very comfortable. Which also, I think that's important to note. I wanted her to be comfortable at the beginning. I didn't want her to start guarded and defensive. I wanted to come at this story from a place of trying to reach understanding. And so at the beginning, you know, she felt very comfortable talking about her upbringing. Once we got into talking about what she said on the tapes, she got much more evasive. She sounded much more rehearsed. I felt like she wasn't addressing my questions. I felt like she was like, I'm not even going to go there. And it was only after pressing her for a very long time that she finally said... I don't know if I'm like the right person to talk about these things. And to be honest, that was like the first real thing she said to me that day. And I felt like I had reached a little bit of a breakthrough at that point. Um, I think there are going to be people who hear the series and are going to say, you know, screw her. I never want to hear from her again. I can't believe I had to hear from her for this whole series. I'm still hopeful that she engages with these topics. You know, somebody wrote a piece about the series and they quoted a leader of a Latino nonprofit who said, Nuri has every right to say her side of the story, but I wish that she had started by reaching out to the communities that she had most hurt. And I think that's a very good question, you know, and and to be honest, she didn't. And I don't know, you know, like I felt that I think that was the most frustrating thing to me is that like for her, she had been misunderstood And she was here to clear it up. But I don't think that she had taken the critiques into serious consideration. And I don't know if this story is going to make her now do that, to be honest, which is which is sad to me. So I do want to address this. Uh, You know, 
there's been criticism before the podcast was out as things were being promoted. Episode three is out this week. We personally have connected about the reactions of your podcast. Some have thanked you for your work. Others have been really critical. I think there's a lot of people who are hurt as they hear the tapes again and possibly even hear from Nuri herself and what she has to say. What do you have to say about this idea of possibly giving Nuri a platform to redeem herself? I think that this was a huge story and eventually Nuri was going to talk about it. And like I said, the last time I spoke to you, I'm glad it was me because I have my own set of um, questions that I had about this story. And what I thought was important is that if this was going to happen, I didn't want it to just be like a Nuri tells her side of the tale. I wanted it to be like, what does this tell us? about LA city politics? What does this tell us about Latino voters? What does this tell us about Latino political power? What does this tell us about Latino culture? And I address all those things in the podcast. I mean, episode two, what I love so much about episode two is especially in the second half, we talk so much about the very difficult tensions that the city council is dealing with. Um, To me, this issue of her district having homeowners who are very um, pro-police and who want to clear out unhoused encampments. I mean, that's an issue that even though Nuri's not in power, is still going to be debated for a long time. And I think people should know what's at stake in, in conversations like that. And I think that how Latinos are going to vote in the future in L.A. is an extremely important question to try to understand. And I think we laid out a lot of the complexities of this story in that way. And so if we were going to do it, we were going to do it by contextualizing it, by fact-checking her. Um, You'll hear that in episode three, we do a lot of fact-checking what Nuri says. And I understand the criticism, and I understand that it's hard to hear the personal and human story of someone who has been so dehumanizing, both through her policies and through her words. But I don't think that by not talking to her or by not telling that story, we're actually advancing on these issues. And so my whole goal was to contextualize this story, to contextualize what Nuri said. Um, And also, I think it's an extremely cynical view to like, I think it's it's very like anti-abolitionist and very punishing to not hope that we can evolve from moments like this. Hmm. So you you feel like we could? I think that this story... (laughs) doesn't get to where I wanted us to get to, perhaps, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Yeah. But I don't regret wanting to see a Latino leader who once was a champion for working class families and immigrant families and raising the minimum wage and fighting to stop pollution in her neighborhood that was caused by giant corporations. Like She was somebody who was very much a homegrown hero. And her fall is very sad. And it is her own fault, and I don't think she gets that. And so that's what the reporting showed. I mean, really, the tapes are complicated to hear. They're complicated to, like, break down. It's really complex. The podcast features a lot of Latinx, Latino voices. I'm curious about what people from other communities have told you, specifically Black, maybe LGBTQ communities here in L.A., and what they've voiced, whether it's concerns or praise for the podcast. So I've gotten mixed responses. I saw today a Black Angelino being like, oh, this actually was very clarifying for me um, in a way that doesn't look good for Nuri, (laughs) she wrote. But, you know, one of my Black colleagues here at LAist was upset by the series. And she pointed out something that I think is a really legitimate complaint. She told me that she felt the first episode did not accurately reflect the emotion from Black residents. And I'll say I spent the last 10 years working for Latino USA at NPR And I think I very much produced this from that point of view because that is my history. And I took that note and it's going to change how I do reporting in the future. Something else that I want to mention is that I'm just one person who's been covering this scandal. There has been a lot of incredible work done by people um, who are not me <laughs> and who and I read a lot of this leading up to working on this story that includes people like Janelle Martinez at Remescla, Dani Hernandez, obviously, Erica D. Smith at the LA Times, Nadra Niddle at the 19th. I think that one of the things that gets a little bit confused is the idea that somehow like we're trying to tell like the ultimate story when really I'm adding one perspective 
And I encourage everyone to read all of those articles about this scandal, to get as informed as they can, to th- really think about what the impact on the Black community has been, to think about what the impact on the Oaxacan community has been. Um, and I obviously came to this story as a white Latina. And so that is going to be my limited view into it. But I felt it was important as somebody who also wanted to check my own biases, the biases of loved ones, um, I wanted to come at it from a place of trying to reach understanding because I think the Latino community is so vital to this city. And I think that this was, like I told you in the last time, this was a really embarrassing moment for us. And I wanted to do it from a place of compassion. And I wanted to do it from a place of also almost being exhausting. (laughs) Like, Like I wanted to dig as deep and deep and deep as I could. There's going to be an episode four of the series. What can we expect? Episode four is really more about looking to the future, um, talking about how the city is talking about redistricting given the tapes and also hearing both Nithya Raman and Yunusi Hernandez talk about what their vision for the future of L.A. is as two people who were also derided in the tapes and um, who have slightly different politics than Nuri and the others who are in the recorded tapes. And yeah, I think it's more about looking to the future. Antonia, thank you for hanging with me today. I know this has been a lot in a journey. Appreciate you kind of just hanging out with me and talking about this. Thanks, Brian. That was Imperfect Paradise host Antonia Cerejido. Parts one through three of Nuri in the Secret Tapes are out now. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and look out for another episode coming out next Wednesday. We'll also have episode three on our feed this Friday, so you can check it out then. And if you enjoy listening to How to LA, please show a little love and share the podcast with whoever you can. Thank you. Monica Bushman produced this episode. Catherine Mailhouse provided editing assistance. Our other team members are Victoria Alejandro, Megan Botel, Evan Jacoby, and Erica Washington. Megan Larson is our executive producer, and Hasmik Pagosian is our engineer. We'll be back tomorrow with an episode of How to LA, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.